before we get started. So this week, uh, today and Thursday, we're going to be looking at um, two late 20th century controversies, uh, particularly in the uh, Churches of Christ, that stream of the Restoration Movement, since of course that's the, the Heritage of Faulkner, and that, uh, as I mentioned way back in the beginning of the class, was the side we were going to emphasize. Um, the controversy today we're looking at is the the development of the International Churches of Christ, sometimes referred to as the Boston Movement uh, or the Crossroads Movement, eventually kind of developing into its own religious organization. And don't forget that the last of the Restoration of the Ancient Order of Things essays is due on Friday of this week, and then also the um, critical review of David Lipscomb's On Civil Government is also due uh, the week after, the 21st. So keep that in mind as uh, we're coming closer to the end of the semester. The study guide for the final uh, should be available Thursday, so uh, that'll help in preparation for the, um, the, last, um, the last couple weeks here of the, the course as we are uh, winding down. So, in order to think about the development of the Boston Movement or the International Churches of Christ, there are a couple of preliminary things that are important for setting the stage. First has to do with the changes that were taking place related to ministry to college students um, in the 1960s and 1970s. Now, from the perspective of where we were a couple weeks ago, talking about the institutionalization of um, Churches of Christ and the response to that, we uh, mentioned briefly the Bible Chair Movement, uh, this uh, attempt by uh, members of the Restoration Movement to develop um, funded academic positions that were uh, connected with state universities, as the state uh, universities developed. Uh, state universities were not teaching religion, um, but of course a lot of people were drawn to them uh, for education, so the Bible chairs became a way for the disciples and the Churches of Christ to provide religious instruction uh, to um, people that were attending uh, those, those places. Funded entirely by uh, contributions from congregations. Uh, they weren't funded by the state. Um, although, of course, as we noted, eventually some of those uh, institutions did uh, allow some academic credit towards a bachelor's degree uh, from taking uh, courses from the movement. The first Bible chair um, among the Churches of Christ was set up in uh, at the University of Texas. It was kind of an on and off type of thing. It would run for a while and then, uh, and then it wouldn't run for a while and then it ran for a while again. And, uh, kind of the 1980s was when uh, it eventually kind of died off. A Bible chair lectureship was started in 1957, um, but as you move through the latter part of the, tra uh, the, uh, the 20th century, you see this transition taking place um, moving from these academic positions into more uh, traditional uh, college or campus types of ministry. Um, so you have this kind of transition that's taking place because there are some people among Churches of Christ in the 1960s who are interested in getting graduate degrees in religion. Um, some of that in biblical studies, some of that in theology, some of that in a history of American Christianity. And so they're going to a variety of institutions to get that. Some of those institutions are uh, connected with um, a variety of denominations. Others of those are um, state schools that are developing religion programs in the latter part of the 20th century. But as they're graduating, there are only so many colleges uh, and positions open, and so a lot of them uh, connect with these Bible chairs and fill these Bible chairs, which 
tends to make them more academic because here they are with advanced degrees. Uh, they've been uh, going through this kind of graduate study, and so they're tending to focus on the more academic side. Then you have, on the other hand, people who are more interested and more focused on what we might call spiritual formation. Uh, these are people who are wanting to help the spirituality of um, you know, members of Churches of Christ that are going to state institutions. Um, they're also interested in evangelizing and you know, trying to reach out to students at these various, uh, at these various colleges uh, to try and provide them uh, some guidance uh, religiously as well. And so you have these, uh, this kind of divergence in the purpose of uh, the Bible chairs, and some going the direction more of the academic study, others going more in the spiritual formation study, uh, uh, the spiritual formation trajectory. Now, as the Bible chairs disappeared, right, as that, that declined, some of those were rolled into departments of religion at these various colleges. Um, some of these professors also got uh, other jobs at state universities, some of those with uh, universities related to the Churches of Christ or other colleges connected with the Restoration Movement. And those that were more spiritually focused or spiritually, spiritual formationally focused uh, tended to transform into what we now refer to as a campus minister or college minister. So you have that one component, is the development here of these campus ministries versus the Bible chairs. So that trajectory is an important part of this as well. Another important component here is the transformation of a worldview within uh, society, uh, in Western culture at large, that is changing the way a lot of people think about certain basic ideas, like, for example, the nature of truth. What is truth? Is there such a thing as objective truth, or is all truth uh, subjective, only based on the internal or the individual understanding of truth? Now, in one respect, let's start first by talking a little bit about modernism first, because you have to kind of understand modernism before you can understand postmodernism. So modernism was an outlook, um, and we've seen some of the ways in which modernism influenced biblical studies, theology, it's very important in the split between the disciples of Christ and the churches of Christ, but modernism in general was developing a mindset that, or, or modernism was a mindset that was developing that tended to look at the world in very secular types of ways. And so while Western culture, through the 19th century, um, tended to exhibit um, people connecting reality, understanding the nature of truth with God, um, from the 18th century on, you see this rise of a secular type of mindset that appealed to Reality appeals to truth um, separate and apart from God. And so there, you, know, you, you have this uh, secular mindset, very naturalistic, and a developing mindset that essentially says this world is all that there is. There is nothing supernatural. There's nothing beyond nature. There's only what we can experience through our senses. So the modernist viewpoint tended to be very humanistically focused encouraging the improvement of human beings, um, encouraging the flowering of human beings. Uh, with that, of course, is the development of certain secular ideas about human rights versus a uh, view of human rights that would center something in uh, things like, you know, human beings created in the image of God. This is much more about human flourishing separate and apart from God. And so the modernist outlook tended to be optimistic, you know, the, the, the potential that human beings had. But as the 20th century wore on, the modernist um, viewpoint started to decline. 
And there were a variety of reasons for this, most of them having to do with the optimism of human progress being shipwrecked on, you know, the reality of two world wars, a variety of other military conflicts, um, the, the lived experience of, you know, here are, the, here are these great opportunities and great challenges, industrialism, uh, technological, technological developments, um, economic prosperity, for example, beliefs that, well, this is going to end poverty. Well, poverty didn't end. And in fact, the, the distance between the rich and the poor grew throughout the 20th century. And so, you know, there's an example of how the modernist outlook was found. The, um, the ways in which in the latter part of the 20th century we began to see uh, environmental degradation, um, a variety of other things happening to the environment, how the modernist outlook um, didn't really pay attention to the environmental consequences of, of it. So you have all this industrialization, but nobody's really paying attention to how that industrial waste is having a naturalistic impact on the environment around us. Um, and so by the 1960s, 1970s, you know, more and more people are becoming aware that this kind of technological development at all costs was having serious consequences when it came to the environment. Um, you have the proliferation of weapons throughout the uh, 20th century, especially after World War II, the rise in nuclear weapons. Uh, again, driven by this uh, modernist outlook of, uh, you know, this kind of nationalism attached with human progress, attached with, you know, science, and all these kind of things just kind of um, exhibited how modern human beings didn't have sometimes an ethical core that was guiding some of those uh, developments, uh, like you know, the, the atom bomb or, or other expressions of uh, nuclear uh, warfare. You have a continued development throughout the 20th century of people afflicted with a variety of psychological problems. Modern life did not ease uh, the, human, uh, the human psyche. In fact, it made it worse as more people were affected by worry and anxiety, stress, some of that diagnosed, some of it not diagnosed. Um, you know, you have a rise of all sorts of uh, issues, uh, psychologically, emotionally, that people suffer from, eating disorders. So there's just all sorts of ways in which this kind of modernist outlook um, and some of the things that the consequences of it uh, led to a variety of problems. There were social problems, economic problems, all sorts of things that, that came out of this. Furthermore, you had a, the development of uh, globalization uh, to a greater degree, this kind of developing interconnection of cultures. And so as cultures became more uh, interdependent, interdependent on each other, that led to uh, greater uh, connections with other cultures, but it also led to greater conflict with others. Um, as as technology kind of encouraged uh, this kind of interaction, I mean, the ways in which we can um, communicate with people around the world, the ways in which we can discover information, um, the, the diversity of media that now exists both in the United States and elsewhere. So, you know, of course, um, films from the United States have been going overseas for, for decades, but now we're starting to see uh, people getting interested in uh, cinema and, and other types of media from uh, other countries. Um, so you have all of these kind of things that are taking place that are bringing cultures uh, together that are leading to this kind of postmodern outlook that has been developing since the 1970s that essentially is kind of, you know, Questioning the modern standpoint on truth, on uh, what necessarily are, are positive types of things, uh, is also influenced by globalization. 
And so po the postmodern outlook started to question um, this notion of what is sometimes referred to as grand narratives or meta narratives. Uh, a grand narrative or a meta narrative refers to an overarching story that uh, gives meaning to a particular culture. So to put it quite simply, if we're talking about Christianity, the, the meta narrative of Christianity is that God created the world, uh, created human beings as a special part of that creation, um, but human beings fell into sin, uh, rebelled against uh, God, and God has uh, gradually worked uh, about a plan of redemption culminating in Christ to bring us back into relationship with him. Um, very briefly, of course. Uh, the, you know, there would be a lot more to it if we were trying to set it out clearly. But that's kind of what a grand narrative is. That's the, the narrative, the, the overarching story that guides Christianity and for uh, several centuries have guided a lot of Western culture. 